Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba <laughs> Okay. Before I talk, sorry. D and D habit. When you do this, it means you're talking out of character. I'm hoping that this will be a shorter video. <laughs> In a world where people like to narrate '90s movie commercials, we are talking about movies from the 1990s. I'm Ramin. I'm Michael. I'm Molly. I'm Erica. Today we're talking about some of the movies in 1990 that we have the most to say about. So that when we get to the rest of the movies in 1990, that can be a shorter video. I just get so happy when they finally let her shop. Which is a line, not from Pretty Woman, but from Romy and Michelle's high school reunion <laughs> ah! opening scene when they're watching Pretty Woman. <laughs> Am I right in thinking that um, that was sort of Julia Roberts' first big star break. Like she might have had other movies before that, but that was like her big one. And boy, talk about America's sweetheart, right? The movie is a feel good romantic mm. comedy. Everybody loves it. When you're flipping through the channels on like Sunday afternoon and you're bored and it's on, you have to stop and watch it. It's the law. I don't make the rules. This is just what you do. You watch it from whatever point you're at, whether it's um, her meeting Richard Gere, in the car or like the opera scene which of course we're all opera people so we love um they go to see traviata which if you know anything about la traviata it's basically echoing kind of like the same like sort of a rich guy thing happening oh and it has a really excellent performance by jason alexander and he plays kind of a villain and it's kind of um he's kind of horrible and great i love this movie and i've watched it about one thousand times and i do just get so happy when they finally let her shop so i actually don't really know pretty woman all that well but the one thing that i wanted to add is the roy orbison song which is from 1964. <laughs> that's a thread that i want to follow with old songs coming back in 1990 in films you know, Richard Gere, as the leading male in this movie, like, there is a reason he has this superstar status. He's suave and sophisticated. He's respectful at the same time as being a little jerky, and he manages that so well that you can't help but fall in love with him. I have always, always loved Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I may have been too young to see it at the time because it was a very dark turn for the Ninja Turtles movie. So the dark take on the Ninja Turtles world, like we had the comics and we had the toys first for Ninja Turtles. The movie came later and the movie wanted to be more stylized than when they created it. They wanted to put more of that dark spin on this ninja world in the city. And it was a really, really creative approach and to make these guys actually like teenagers. But when somebody started pitching, let's do a live action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, nobody wanted it. Nobody bought it. This is actually an independent film. And it's one of the most successful independent films in all of history. We forget that. I but did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wanted to make this. And it was the most successful independent film until Blair Witch Project almost 10 years later. Wow. You know, it was huge. Jim Henson was the creator of the costumes, his workshop. This was actually the last movie that he was affiliated with before he died. He died like a month after it came out in theaters. But even he was hesitant to be a part of it because he thought it was too dark. He thought it was too violent. Disney didn't want to buy it. Warner Brothers didn't want to buy it. All, none of the producers and studios wanted to be affiliated because they didn't want to take on this this level of violence and darkness. I don't know that I ever perceived it as being like particularly dark, yeah. but now that you mention it, like it really was. There were a lot of like dark like walking alone down an alley getting ambushed and like going into like and you know it really was like a kung fu movie right yeah. like it was really all about like the action scenes but i'm sorry i cannot get away from like the bizarre costumes there are scenes where like they're trying to hide that they're turtles and they wear a trench coat i guess they do that in like the cartoon also and you're like why is that guy's face like green and he has no nose like <laughs> <laughs> what is going on <laughs> By the way, fun fact, so there were separate voice actors and physical actors for the Turtles. And the only one that was, it was one and the same was Raphael. He was both the physical actor and the voice actor for his. All the others had separate actors, but all four of the physical actors made cameos in other spots in the movie. And you can actually see them in person. And I looked this okay, up, like the guy funny. who played Raphael is the guy in the taxi cab 
when he goes, what the hell was that? When the car, when he goes rolling over the hood of the taxi, that was him. Oh. And I just remember like Splinter being like such a like sage, like Mr. Miyagi character. And I felt like all of his scenes were like very serious. Mm -hmm. Except like, wasn't there like a part like at the end where he's like, party on dude. Cowabunga. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's what it was. Yes. Yeah, I know I watched this movie all the time as a kid. I barely remember it. Um, I was obsessed with the turtles. So I know I was never into the comics. The comics, as Erica said, did come first. But the comics were actually also way dark. Uh, it was the cartoon that turned things kid friendly. It really, it's, it's it, from, from what I understand, it's not a super kid friendly comic. And the cartoon made it kid friendly. So I, I imagine the struggle that you're talking about is mostly people like, well, this cartoon exists that all these kids love. We got to make it. <laughs> Playmate Toys was another one that never got on board because they didn't want to market such a dark thing. They wanted to stick with the lighter side that created around the cartoons. Yeah, yeah. And well, and really the cartoon was made to sell the toys. Two things. First, I think I was like the age demographic that like the child friendly version of the turtles before this film was marketed to. Because remember, I was two when this film came out. And so like, I remember liking the Teenage Mutant Turtles toys i think i watched the show at some point but i was also two you know my parents probably shouldn't have let me have any of this stuff here's a cute turtle with a nunchuck little two-year-old boy you know <laughs> like have fun i also wanted to highlight because this is a trend later in one of the movies i'm going to discuss that this point in like late 80s into early 90s in children's media there's this weird evolving trend toward like dark versions of these narratives that we're so used to. We talked about this a little bit with Batman last time. Movies based on comics around the late 80s were actually considered like not trendy and not sexy. Like nobody wanted to get into them because of this reason, because of like the darkness and wanting to stay true to the comics that had originated maybe decades before in some cases like Batman. And they couldn't decide if they wanted to go, stick with this lighter, more kid friendly version or if they wanted to be true and, and stick with that darker storyline. So this was actually another big step forward for the comic movies in general, along with the original Batman, which came out around the same time. And I mean, yes, this stuff isn't intended for kids, but like what these things are intended for often doesn't really matter. Like, because if, if enough consumers interpret it as being intended for a certain demographic and it makes them money, then it, guess what? Now it's for kids because it's also for, you know, the CEO's paycheck. Now it sounds like I'm getting down on the turtles and I'm not getting down on the turtles. But there's also this part of me and maybe it's just that I was only originally exposed to this when I was too young to even really fathom it. But there's something about like this trend toward, and it's a trend that's coming back toward turning all of this stuff into live action movies that I'm like, really? I don't want to get down on the movie. I'm sure it's entertaining, but like also was anybody who was consuming these like, man, I really wish there were a live action version. The inclination to make it a live action movie, I think probably started with the idea of making like a Kung Fu movie, right? Mm -hmm. With the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like because they are ninja turtles, right? And so, and I think there is a long tradition of, of the Kung Fu movie genre and martial arts movies because people like to watch fucking cool fight scenes, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so why not do it in a creepy turtle costume? Yeah. <laughs> but also ninjas were huge in so many media in the late 80s and early 90s. They were everywhere. Like so many video games have ninja protagonists Karate around this kid. time. Karate Kid. Yeah, there's a whole lot. I don't even know if I've seen the film Dick Tracy all the way through, but that's sort of okay for what I want to talk about. So, because I really want to talk about Dick Tracy in other media. So this film was directed and starred Warren Beatty, and it also starred Madonna and Al Pacino, and it's a, it's, a, it's a big name cast. And the score, the underscore was by Danny Elfman, but then it had a whole bunch of original songs by Stephen Sondheim. And I don't know if anyone really takes the film seriously at all, but this was, everywhere in other media. So this uh, comes from a 1931 comic strip. And for whatever reason, Warren Beatty's like, I really want to make this a film. And I really want to cast myself as the lead. <laughs> I think other than that, a lot of the things that came from it are a really great 
Madonna slash Stephen Sondheim album. We'll be talking more about this album when we get to music in 1990, but there's some really excellent Sondheim songs in it. Sooner or later, more and Back in Business are really excellent Sondheim songs. They are better when someone other than, other than Madonna sings them, but... Um, Shots fired. We'll return to this when we get to music in 1990. But this is the, the, the soundtrack album for this. Is The original recording of Vogue is on this album. Is it? Yes. Oh. Other than, than the comic book connection and the album, this also birthed so many video games. This is around the time that almost every movie that a child might watch has a video game on every system for. I just want to express my admiration for you in turning a discussion about a movie into a discussion <laughs> about music and video games. Congratulations, <laughs> Michael. Molly, you and Danger Girl. Because <laughs> we're, we're talking about Ghost. This movie stars Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore and Whoopi Goldberg. This is another thing where I wanted to bring in an old song that was recorded in the 60s coming back in a 1990s movie because Unchained Melody by the Righteous Brothers was originally recorded in 1965. This guy dies because he gets too close to some shady dealings. The incriminating evidence is at his apartment. So they go after his girlfriend that he lives with too. And he, as a ghost, tries to stop them from getting her. There's some really excellent scenes. The possession slash dance scene, when Patrick Swayze's ghost possesses Whoopi Goldberg and then Whoopi Goldberg and Demi Moore have a beautiful dance scene. It's really actually lovely. <laughs> Evil spirits that drag the dead bad guys to hell at different points in the film. They actually really scared me. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's part of why I'm still afraid of parking garages. This is another one that I love, and it's another, like, if you see it on TV, stop and watch it. I just want to say, I think par uh, parking garages are scary. I think we can all agree that they're just spooky places, mm -hmm. especially, like, empty parking garages. Yeah, when no one else is around. Ugh. Yeah. Patrick Swayze is so sexy in this movie. <laughs> I mean, oh my god, the it's pottery true. scene is so, like, uh, just iconic. Can we just like have a memorial for Demi Moore's pixie cut? Because I feel like that look was so good on her. And like now, and I feel like for a long time, she has just had this like long share hair yeah. that I don't know. I liked her with short hair. We talked about this when we were talking about some other Patrick Swayze film. But I think Patrick Swayze is a man for straight women. I like. I don't know too many gays who are all that excited about Patrick Swayze. Though I do think the pottery scene is really hot. I just don't think he's that hot in it. I don't know. Honestly, I would go for Whoopi Goldberg or Demi Moore over Patrick Swayze. <laughs> this is a whole new side yeah. of you. <laughs> I agree with Molly. Demi Moore is objectively hotter with short hair. Unless she was hot in G.I. Jane too, but I don't know if that's a whole other side of me also. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel so gay. And it's in a also... lesbian world. <laughs> it's much more of a gay story than a baseball story. Well, you know what else is much more of a gay story than a baseball story? <laughs> Actually, no, it's neither of those things. The best worst movie of all time, Troll 2. This movie is hilarious. It is supposed to be a horror film. It is not scary in the slightest. It's just funny. So part of the problem is that it was written and directed and mostly staffed, like mostly the crew, it's mostly Italian people, making this film in the US. And most of the actors are untrained, inexperienced actors. The film is about the horrors of vegetarianism. <laughs> <laughs> troll 2 has no trolls in it. It is the sequel to Troll, but there are no trolls, and it's actually not connected to that movie at all. The monster villains in this one are goblins. There's a family swap, this ci city family and this country family. The city family are the main characters, especially the dad of the city family is always wanted to be a farmer. So he arranges with this country family to do like a house swap for a month. Before they go, the little boy of the family, the little boy is visited by the ghost of his dead grandfather telling him that where they're going is like the hometown of the goblins and they want to eat your family. But the goblins are actually all vegetarians. So they don't eat you right away. They instead feed you some poisoned food, which is itself vegetarian food, that turns you into a plant. And then they eat the plant. They're eating her. And then they're gonna eat me! Oh my god! <laughs> For most of my life, if people would ask me, what's your favorite movie? 
I honestly have not had an answer to that question because there are so many that I love. And as I was getting ready for this movie, I realized, you know what? This is it. This is my favorite movie. Home Alone is my favorite movie. This is John Hughes at his finest. And then he hires Chris Columbus. Chris Columbus was actually not originally supposed to do this movie. He was supposed to be doing National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and had a big headbutt with Chevy Chase and walked away from the project. He got hired again by John Hughes to come over. We're gonna do Home Alone. Home Alone is this sort of perfect Christmas movie in that it revolves around a family that is unique, but also relatable. The script is ideal. The comedy is brilliant. The score is fantastic. They were trying to get the composer who couldn't do the job because he was too busy working on Rescuers Down Under. <laughs> So they were like, we'll never get John Williams. They apparently took it to John Williams and in his own words, John Williams went dippy when he saw the movie and fell in love with it. He's like, I will absolutely do this. So it stars Catherine O'Hara, the inimitable. We have John Hurd, who sadly passed away recently, uh, also another brilliant actor who didn't want to do this movie. There were a lot of people who didn't want to do this movie. And then we have, of course, Macaulay Culkin. And I loved him because he was portraying an eight-year-old in the movie at the time that I was exactly eight years old. He reminded me of my favorite cousin. I hope none of my other cousins are watching this right now. <laughs> Every single one of my cousins is my favorite cousin. You've got Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern playing the two criminals, which was brilliant, and they didn't want to do the movie either. It spent nine months in theaters. There's still a term in old Hollywood for it. It got home alone. That's when one movie that is really excellent gets overshadowed by the wild success of another. They still say it got Home Alone because that's what Home Alone did to everything else. Something that makes Home Alone great is if I watched it with the sound off or with a foreign language dubbed over it, it would still be hilarious and you would still get everything mm -hmm. right like it could be a silent movie and on you know we were kind of having an off-camera conversation earlier about the nature of like physical comedy um or clowning which there is a lot of in this movie and what this movie does so well is that it's basically a cartoon it's a live action roadrunner and coyote you watch the whole thing like this <laughs> you know, and then it's so heartwarming at the end. And don't forget, I don't think you mentioned John Candy is in this movie. <laughs> and almost every single one of his, almost every one of his lines is he's complete his, improv. He's hysterical in it with Ka uh, uh, Catherine O'Hara. Show me somebody who doesn't like Home Alone, and then like I just don't really want to talk to them. Like, yeah. They're not fun at parties. It's true. Building on what Molly was saying, I think what makes this movie so funny how much heart this film has yes. like this is this is such a touching film and that in turn makes it funnier that contrast makes it funnier also i think it's interesting that in sort of family movies like this it's very often the case that in order to appease the child audience the parent figures are portrayed as oafish and unaware and like the kids are the ones really saving the day mom and dad but this movie is also, in addition to all the other reasons that, that make it such a classic and so unique, it's also unique in that her character's plight is really relatable. Like, Kevin is kind of a little shit. I mean, yes, it's her fault for being the adult and losing track of her child, but it's also, like, in the circumstance and context, kind of not, and you can kind of really relate to her. It's one of the few children's movies that, looking back when I watch it over again, I'm not like oh, this was the part that was supposed to be for me, the kid. Oh, this was the part that was supposed to be for me, the adult. Like, you can relate to all the protagonists in this movie. Like, I am rooting for Kevin to take out the assholes in the same way that I'm rooting for his mom to punish the fuck out of him when she sees him again. It takes some real good, really good direction and acting to make that click with an audience, those dual views. Speaking of movies that got home alone, as Erica said, the Rescuers Down Under <laughs> came out at about the same time. I want to say maybe even the same day. Yeah, same day. Right? Even though in hindsight, it's been critically acclaimed and it was acclaimed at the time too. It was kind of a box office flop because it got home alone. The Rescuers Down Under <laughs> takes the, uh, the original Rescuers premise of an, a rescue agency based around mice, which makes little sense. 
and um, and I'm gonna stop the accent now because <laughs> oh it's one of only a few animated Disney movies that has no sung music in it. What's interesting about this one compared to the other one is in both movies, they are rescuing a little kid who is separated from anybody else to help them. In the first movie, it's an orphan. In the second, it's this movie, this kid named uh, Cody, who um, through like certain circumstances ends up discovering the identity of this poacher and what he plans to do. And so he like kidnaps the kid and they're going to rescue him. But what's interesting in the different ways that these movies handle this rescuing the kiddo uh, scenario is in the first movie, they're rescuing this orphan named Penny and they meet her right away. Like in the first 30 to 45 minutes of the movie. In this movie, they don't meet Cody for a while. It's about halfway into the movie until they even meet him. The structure of both movies is markedly different because of that. Instead of it all being like the first one, which is this sort of sentimental um, journey this little girl has, even as they're also facing this weird um, Cruella de Vil knockoff. Um, the second movie is much more about like, you get much more time to establish each of these characters as individuals. And there's also these beautiful animation sequences of like these sweeping flights on, I wanna say Eagleback, I'm trying to remember the exact bird. It's pretty fun to see a movie that can evoke so much magic and warmth without a lot of those devices we're used to seeing in like an animated feature film like song like music which um the soundtrack is still really good it's just that there's no musical numbers so this was going to be i think it was the first full-length feature film from disney to use computer animation and they used a lot of that for some of the big action sequences or the flights on the the great golden eagle marahute yeah marahute i think marahute the magic of the golden eagle, right? Like this majestic creature. And then I became a birder. And, <laughs> and then I was in search of a golden eagle. And then I saw a golden eagle for the first time like a year ago in the Grand Canyon. And it was pretty awesome moment. I just want to say I'm really eager for our next Disney movie because each of them gives us a deeper revelation into Molly's <laughs> Dances with Wolves is an epic movie about Kevin Costner discovering that Native Americans are people. There was a lot of talk at the time that the movie came out is something that was really seen as really important was the use of Native American actors to play Native Americans. Something that to this day is kind of rare and an anomaly, which is really unfortunate because I think um, people should be able to tell their own stories. Then again, this is definitely a white savior movie. This is my first of uh, two Winona Ryder sort of features today. So I will be your professor of Winona Ryder's studies. I think that something that is fascinating about the Tim Burton output is that a lot of these stories, they focus on contrasting light and dark, right? And, and so I say light and dark, but it's really more complex than that. It's sort of standard conformist American culture that is sort of generalized by like suburban America, right? And the, the more outcast people who do not identify with the suburban ideals, people who tend toward the gothic. Edward Scissorhands is a movie about a person who is a sort of a Frankenstein type creature who has scissors for hands, naturally. And he lives in this spooky sort of gothic uh, mansion overlooking this suburban town and one day an Avon lady comes knocking on his door and discovers him and is like hey he's actually kind of nice even though he's spooky looking and like invites him to like move in with her and he like lives with her family and all of this stuff and falls in love with Winona Ryder. It does what a lot of these Tim Burton movies do which is showing that actually it's it's that conformist suburban life that has more darkness to it than the alternative way of living. What is interesting about it is that he doesn't say that the suburban people are exclusively bad. He always finds the good ones. <laughs> Edward Scissorhands Hands is a really sweet, heartwarming movie. I think it's one of Tim Burton's best, although I'm a Beetlejuice person myself. Yeah, I was actually gonna ask you if you thought this was the best <laughs> Tim Burton film, because I know a lot of people do say that. 
So actually, let's ask the audience, is this the best Tim Burton film? Because I haven't seen it, and I don't know. If this is not the best Tim Burton film, what is? There's like two extremes on the Tim Burton axis, hyper dark and hyper gothic, which I would put like Sweeney Todd in, ignoring the many issues I have with that movie. If I had to put it somewhere on the spectrum, it's like super serious and super grim. And part of the problem with it really is that it sucked out all the funny parts from the mu musical and just turns them like unironic. And the opposite end of that spectrum of Tim Burton movies is like Alice in Wonderland, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like so dark, it's stupid, like, and, and funny, like like taking the darkness to a, a purposeful point of absurdity to make it actually comical. And to me, why this movie is great is because it strikes a really delicate balance between those things. Like there are a lot of points in the movie that are like silly, absurd. That's like, first of all, there's this dude with scissors for hands. Come on, come on, come on. But then there's also like dark aspects too to it. Like you, you learn how he is like covered in cuts because he accidentally hurts himself. It's this constant like tug of war in terms of tone for me and all the performances in it are pretty great too. This is about people being authentic. This Edward Scissorhands character who in many ways is very vulnerable and it doesn't occur to him that anything could be different necessarily. But then there's also the authenticity or lack thereof of the people in the town. I don't have a lot of feelings about Tim Burton films, honestly. They're not really my jam, but I, I feel like of the ones I've seen, I've seen most of them, I think, is that this is the one that it's most, I, I feel like this is the most Tim Burton at his most authentic self. Fuck you, Johnny Depp. I just don't want anybody here to think that I endorse Johnny Depp at all because he's a wife-beating piece of shit. Look Who's Talking To was a fun movie. I have read recently that it was not very highly acclaimed. It did not rate well. It did not do well in the box office because everybody was comparing it to the first one. I really thought it was funny. Bruce Willis is, is definitely like the action hero and he's had some comedic background, but this was sort of a refreshing take on this little boy to have this big kind of Bruce Willis-y kind of thing. And they, they had thought of going a little more R-rated with it. He apparently recorded some lines that were a little less family friendly. If you think about it, this like premise of voicing over the images of babies, which is basically like a good three quarters of the humor in this movie, is kind of a pretty good predictor of like a lot of internet memes. I wanna see the R-rated cut. So continuing our uh, discussion of Winona Ryder movies of the late 80s and early 90s, class is back in session. This is just a sentimental favorite of mine. In my childhood, they were like, you know, it's Friday night, you go to Blockbuster and everybody would pick out a movie and then we would go home and, you know, we would figure out which movie we were gonna watch as a family. And every once in a while, my mother got her way. <laughs> And when my mother got her way, we would end up watching a movie like Mermaids, <laughs> which stars Cher as a struggling single mother to a teenage Winona Ryder and a very young Christina Ricci who spends the whole movie just like pulling gags and faces uh, and stealing the scene from her star uh, family members. And then um, the detective from Roger Rabbit is like the manic pixie dream dude who comes in and like rescues Cher and teaches her how to like be settled down and have a family um, instead of being the town tramp as Winona Ryder accuses her of in the climactic argument of the movie where there is an excellent share slap. <laughs> it is a movie about the Winona Ryder character having kind of a sexual awakening, but she's like, Catholicism obsessed and she's like constantly reading the lives of the saints and so she's struggling um with the this feeling of she's having these impure sexual thoughts that means that she is a fallen woman going to hell or whatever it ultimately leads to the denouement of the movie where Cher slaps her and then basically they sort of make up and realize that Family is about togetherness and not about accusing each other of being sluts. Her mother, the Cher character, has a string of boyfriends and so she knows what sex is. Like she clearly is surrounded by it and kind of horrified by it, but also enthralled by it. And like, that's the whole sort of character arc. This feeling of sex is wrong and sinful and bad. And also I want it, <laughs> which I think most of us who have ever been teenagers can relate to. But it is interesting because she's not in an environment where 
she is being taught these religious rules she has imposed them upon herself because um i think her mother has a very sort of loose way of raising her children and so she's seeking out structure in her life that she doesn't have and so she turns to catholicism to find that it has some very serious themes throughout about you know mother daughter tension and and how these mother daughter relationships often can explode <laughs> Kindergarten Cop, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, was mostly panned by critics. If you look at the list of films we've talked about today, at least half of them are family movies. And family movies, at least in my like experience, and at least from this time period, tend to fall into sort of three subcategories. Family movies that are intended for the whole family to watch, but clearly meant for children. Those clearly meant for mom and those clearly meant for dad. And all three of them are supposed to be for the family. This one to me is an ex a rarer example of one that is clearly marketed for dad more than the kids or mom. It stars Arnold Schwarzenegger as a detective who has to find this witness who is connected to this drug dealer. She's the drug dealer's ex-wife. Arnold Schwarzenegger and his partner determine that the kid is probably at the, a kindergartner at this one school. His partner, she's the one who at first becomes a substitute teacher as her sort of undercover identity and is teaching the class where they think this kid is, but she gets injured or something. And so Arnold Schwarzenegger has to step in. The whole movie is trying to tight, st trying to tight, trying to strike this weird tonal balance between like undercover cop movie and like, isn't it hilarious to watch big hulking Arnold Schwarzenegger have to wrangle some kiddos? I enjoy this movie. What I like about this movie is that it's in that genre that we discussed before with Dead Poet Society of teacher who's just gotta reach these kids. Uh, movies that explore how the teacher does reach these kids. But the reason why I, why I, a real life elementary teacher, like this movie as a better version of those is first, it's one of the only ones of those teacher movies that is about elementary school. All the others are about high school, maybe middle school. I think Mr. Holland's Opus is middle school. School of Rock. Okay, that's another one. And that's also a comedy. Interesting, right? That the elementary school ones are always the comedies. And then the middle and high school ones are always these like dramatic, like, you know, savior complex films, basically. I like this movie. I still have some issues with it though. <laughs> like the fact that we're trying to like awkwardly squish this detective plot into this movie that is otherwise all about how Arnold Schwarzenegger through the clever use of ferrets tames children. It's also got some pretty interesting ideas, you know, about how elementary age children actually work and like how, how to actually handle them. But I mean, I won't go into that because realism clearly is not the point of this movie. Is Arnold Schwarzenegger's character having to figure out who he is, have to figure out a different way of teaching and working with little kids in ways that are hilarious and also very heartwarming and you can tell that he's kind of haunted but he's sort of working through a lot of that with playing with kids and working with these other teachers and also trying to do his job and the backup partner was like he couldn't have done it without her he's not a tuba elijah wood auditioned to be in this mm -hmm. but he was told he was not a believable child <laughs> But one of the things I really like about this film is that it actually goes into just like, kids are weird. The little boy who looks up girls' dresses and has a Barbie with him to like compare what they are <laughs> what they look like. It's like, that's, that's weird, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Ramin pointed out that we talked about a lot of family films, but we were children when these came out. So it uh, makes sense. I was thinking the same thing. It, it makes sense that the movies that we know are mostly family films. And I'm not sure I would call Kindergarten Cop a family movie. There's the drug dealing and the sex and the very adult themes that I think might be just enough to kind of keep kids out of the room on this one. Do we know what the rating was? They were pretty like heavy handed with the PG ratings back then. Yeah. Like, they P would give anything a PG rating. This was PG-13. Oh, really? <laughs> This is a teenager movie. Yeah. Uh, that's our last film. I had an idea that I would like to pitch to all of you and to everyone watching. I famously do not watch and have not seen many films. So when we get to 91, I'm kind of thinking that we should do a poll to make me watch a film. 
<laughs> that I've not seen before from 1991. So we can pull the audience and also the three of you. Which film should I watch from 1991? So anyone watching this, comment below what film from 1991 I should watch, because I probably haven't seen it. I've seen so few movies. Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, please, you know, the stuff that we're supposed to say, comment, like, subscribe. We team a group yourselves. See you next time. <laughs> Robocop 2 is the sequel to RoboCop.